<laughs> Let me follow up with a couple of things George uh, mentioned. One, this rapid turnover. Oh, gosh, that's where the light is, isn't it? Uh, uh, this, this past year, I had 35 uh, transgenic varieties in my variety test, and I did a two-year average and three-year average. I had five that had been in there for three years. And Bill, you know, a few years ago, we, we'd say, yeah, I got to have three-year average where you might, you know, kind of feel comfortable with it. These things are turning over tremendously quick, and by the time I learn a number, they just change numbers on them. I, I don't know if they change the variety, but they change the numbers, so it's kind of hard to keep up with it. These large plot type tests are, are, are very important for uh, and being able to, to figure out how, how things fit in your, in your particular soil types as well as your management. You're also seeing how well they adapt. <clears throat> in our annual variety test, this is 2015 book that we put out, and the back of it is Bill Robertson's uh, large plot test. And that's kind of a similar to what you're doing there. And that's kind of brings these small plots. There's always kind of a question whether small plot data is good. Well, we kind of take that and, and expand on to what Bill does. And as a result of that, I think in what type, the type of work that George does is made for perhaps more of you uh, really get to know how things work and how they respond to different things. Another point you made is uh, about your eye can deceive you. I remember back when Delta Pine 40, 41, 41, mm -hmm. you remember that? Uh, mm -hmm. Boy, that was a showish looking thing. I would have bet my life that that was a lead the test and it would come down. It did. No, I'll put it, just leave it there. <laughs> uh, I had a, um, I, I, and there back early in the 2000s, we had some uh, plots. Now I went out and by the time we started getting the, the, the weigh system to be able to really weigh every plot, we went out in progeny rows, and I visually evaluated all the progeny rows. I had uh, Joe, uh, yeah, Joe Johnson was with me as a postdoc at that point. He had about five, six years of uh, working with cotton. He visually rated them. Then I had this young lady, her first year working with me. I had her. We each did it independently. Then we did correlations. Guess who ended up correlating best with yield? I did. It was like, it was, but, but you know, the correlation was like, Mine was about 0.52, Joe's was 0.50, Joe's was 0 .4, but I was on top. <laughs> the real interesting thing part, if, if in that test, we, we visually rated them from you know, what, zero to 10, being, and, I, and I said, you know, uh, I would arbitrarily say, if it's not, if it's six or greater, that I would save it as a project level. The highest yielding plot in that whole project row test None of us rated it as a six. Every one of us would have thrown it away. And that, that's, that was an eye-opening. That eye can fool you on when you start looking at this. Well, I better get talking about what I'm supposed to talk about. Uh, if I step on your toe, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, what I want to do today is kind of explain this book. We put this out each year. This is 2015. Our 2016 test will be online hopefully by the end of the week. We, the data are already online uh, and hopefully the, the whole whole report will be online by, by the end of the week. Uh, I would like to introduce us Anthony uh, Rouse and Will Barnett. They, if you see any data that's wrong, it's yeah. their fault. <laughs> now, the interpretation may be my problem, but they, they're the ones who do a lot of this data collection. One thing I perspective I'd like for you to go away from this is once a variety gets, you're looking at it, it's already a winner. Uh, a lot of companies, some companies will do as many as 50,000 individual plant selections a year. I can't do that, handle that much, but some companies do. So they've are, uh, time it gets to be a variety, you know, it's already a winner, but it may be not adapted to your Pacific environment, your Pacific, and you can find some bad ones in there that get through their system. So the Pacific adaptation is due to some, some of these very subtle varietal differences. That's what George is talking about. He's, some, he's talking about some of these subtle variations that he could see on his, on, in his <coughs> operation. So today I'm going to primarily focus on cotton varieties grown in Arkansas. They're going to be earlier maturing than what uh, George looks at to a large extent down in Louisiana. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is the University of Arkansas is the one that pays me. So that's the reason I want to talk about those. <laughs> and the other thing is that those are the data that I have most readily available for all these traits that, 
We do, uh, if you'll look through here, there's a lot of, you'll verify, there's a lot of numbers in there. A lot of little bitty numbers. We do a lot of measurements, probably more so, maybe an overkill. But we do that in order to try to identify some of these subtle differences. And that's, I want you to get familiar with these traits that I'm talking about, and then you can look at our data and uh, better interpret it. Uh, but even though we're focused on Arkansas data, a lot of this would be very similar to uh, other states. Uh, uh, the, the varieties would be similar. The major things that we differ in what we measure, or uh, at least that we see and then we measure, uh, how varieties differ is certainly in terms of transgenes, and that is happening faster than I can uh, spit out. Uh, and then we're going to be looking at yield by location, maturity, yield components, pubescence, host plant resistance, and fiber quality. And here's a website where all of these data are available, and that's for all the crops and cotton is there as well. So uh, if you want to look at that. Well, transgenes obviously has, has, has changed. The transgenes we have in cotton has changed a great deal over the last few years. Back 2010 and before, we were uh, uh, B2RF. Just about everything was. Then phytogen came with their WRF, which is somewhat similar. And then what has really driven this is resistant pigweed, as you very well know. Uh, the, the Liberty Length and the uh, uh, Extend varieties now becoming more dominant. It's all resistant pigweed has really driven this great difference and changing our varieties almost daily, seems like. So this is, uh, and I don't see any relief in, in sight, uh, at least from what I hear. I went and looked at uh, the dominant varieties in Arkansas from 2013 to 2016. Most years, it's those top five will make up about 80% of our, our acreage. <coughs> right there in 2013, though, it was under 60%. And that was one of those transitions where we were going from B2, started, uh, the Liberty Link started being introduced, and there was that transition time. And unfortunately, one thing you need to Kind of keep in mind, a lot of times when this new technology comes comes in, new genes, a lot of times it's just put into old, older stuff, and it's not necessarily real good stuff. It takes a while, and if, you, if you're around in the 90s when the first transgenes came in, we talked about a genetic drag, or dri uh, we, we first thought it was a low genetic load, that was it really the, the transgenes were actually reducing the performance of varieties. Then we determined it's more of just a drag. Uh, and the reason was they were back crossing it into old materials and it takes a while to build it back up. We don't see that drag so much, but still, and I think that's kind of what's happened with our Liberty Link. I think there's been a little bit of drag involved uh, initially uh, when these varieties were, uh, came in. Well, uh, obviously uh, the, uh, the Liberty Link became dominant and now the B2 uh, the Extend varieties are. What I'm going to do is here is focus on these five varieties that made up uh, almost 85% of the acreage in Arkansas in 2016. Now, again, uh, uh, and these are really, I'm just taking these as, as an example uh, to show you the subtle variation in these varieties that we were planting in Arkansas. First of all, variation in maturity. We measure plant height, and one thing you'll notice there, there's an asterisk here for variety by location interaction. That means that varieties differ at different locations. And part of the reason for that is that varieties are different. A second reason is that each of our locations apply picks differently. So that's some, some of the variation there of how much picks was put in one place versus the other and how the varieties are responding to picks, as you indicated. One of the important things here, and I think Bill talks about this a lot, if, if it's going to be real tall in our variety test, you better get ready to get your picks out. You know, that, that's an indicator and if you've got an area that tends to grow tall plants, don't grow that. That's very simple. Uh, and if, if you need in a clay soil, you're probably better off taking a little stronger uh, vegetative variety. So that's a good indicator. Now we also do, right at a time of defoliation, we'll go in and do a visual percent open bows. And that gives us some, a, a pretty good indication of just what the maturity is. That's really based on the amount of open bowls relative to green bowl is at that point. This uh, one variety, here, the second one here, this uh, ENG 3406 was 33 out of 35 in plant height. That means it's real short. But we're looking at open bowls, it's about the earliest maturity. 
That's generally the relationship we think. If we have a real tall plant, it'll be late material. If it's a short plant, it'll be early material. But that doesn't always hold. Look here. These two, uh, these two phytogens are pretty uh, uh, short, ninth and tenth out of 35, but they're also early. And that's, that's, that's kind of what, to me, and I'm not trying to pick, I'm not picking varieties. I'm just talking about what I like to see. I like a, a variety that tends to be a little bit taller, but early and mature. That tells me it's got some vegetative ability to perhaps go through some stress situations that, that is good. Now, obviously, late yield is a very important factor for us. And for me, for us in Arkansas, I think we're very fortunate. We, we test our varieties at five locations. That, and each one has some very particular situation. Uh, situation. Manila is a sandy soil uh, over, uh, and Bill does some of his cover crop work that he talked about earlier is, is there. Kaiser is a clay, sharky clay soil. Judd Hill is a silphone soil with verticillium wilt. Now the neat thing about those is they're only about 20 miles north-south from each other and about 40 miles east-west. So they're all in a little bitty area there. They probably get very close to the same temperatures. Maybe different uh, rainfall, but they're, they're basically the same environment. But we've got a very different uh, <coughs> scenario in terms of the soil and the pest situation in each one of those situations and, and for each of those tests. Notice that uh, we always find a strong variety by uh, location interaction for yield. Obviously, this is what I like to see. And this is this phytogen 312. It's in the top, uh, toward the top at every one of the locations. That tells me it's got a very wide adaptability and it's going to probably be able to fit in a lot of different locations. Now, ones that do very well or very poorly at uh, uh, Judd Hill, but like it, this one's first at Manila and 31st at Judd Hill, I suspect some verticillium susceptibility there. Certainly, it's not very tolerant. So, I get uh, by knowing these locations, we can get a lot of inference about that variety. So that, that's a very important part. And anytime as you start, you, you show the chart with different locations, the better you can understand those locations, the better understanding you can put that on, onto your field. And this is where Bill's own farm work really uh, builds in more locations with fewer varieties. So that's a very important part. Now, varieties can get yield in different situations. Now, some people accuse me of going into some tall weeds when I start talking about this, but I'll try to keep it. I'll try to get, keep it simple. And if it's if it's not simple, then I, that means I didn't explain it well. Uh, my uh, well, here's lint percent seed index. Seed index is just simply the the gram weight of 100 seeds. So that's your seed size. Li is lint index. That's the amount of lint that comes from 100 seed. SPA is number of seed per acre. This FS, FPS is fibers per seed, and then fiber, and finally fiber density. Now, to me, the, very, the simplest way you can find lint yield on cotton is simply multiply lint index, the amount of lint per seed, times the number of seed per acre. How Lewis came up with that, by the way, Kayla. That, that makes sense, doesn't it? Think about it. But who knows how many seeds per acre? Well, we can calculate that. <laughs> That's easy. You go out there and one, two, three, four, no. <laughs> no, we take our seed index. That's the important part of getting seed index. A lot of variety testing doesn't uh, get seed index. Once you get your seed index, you can go to your percent, uh, the reversal, of the inverse of lip percent is seed percent. Multiply that times seed cotton yield, and you can get you calculate out seed per acre, or at least estimate. So yeah, that, that's that's an important part, and I, it's it, it aggravates me that uh, well, I better I shouldn't say it. I better be careful how I say. It. A lot of people don't count seed index. It's very easy. Uh, I can count to seed. I uh, count seed and weigh seed. That's that's easy, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Will can even do it. So we're uh, no. It's a very easy thing to do. The thing I like to look at is I like to find a variety that's primarily getting its yield from more lint per seed than number of seed per acre. And the reason for that is it takes more energy, plant energy, to produce seed than it does lint. Lint is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. 
it, it's, there's not much energy there. You get into the seed, there's oil and proteins, and it just takes more plant energy. So if you've got one like this one here, it, it's, it, it, it's yielded primarily by making more seed per acre. It's going to probably be less likely to be, it's probably be more unstable over different environments than one like here that's getting uh, more lint per seed and doesn't rely upon seed per acre. That's a strategy we're taking in our breeding program to really try to push that. And this lint index, and, uh, uh, particularly, is very highly inherited. So it's, it's pretty easy to change. Now, the only problem with that, this one looks real good. It's number three on lint index, number 11 on seed. But look at these two, both of them here. But where the reason they're real high on lint, lint per seed is that they got big seed. That's not good. Just if it's getting its, because it's it's real high amount of lint per seed, because it's big seed, then that's not very good. So that's the reason we come over and do these calculations. We can get this estimate of fibers per seed based on the fiber traits. And then this fiber density is an estimate of number of fibers per unit area of seed coat. So it's standardizing seed size. And that's where, when we start getting this right here, I, I put it in green. That's what I like to really see one that's yielding very good but also has this high fiber density now that's kind of getting in the weeds but that's where you start getting into these very subtle differences as you start looking at these varieties really differ a great deal and I, I just I didn't select these five these are just having me the five that were planted most so there's some very di real differences in varieties that we plant that's yield components so let's go and look at the host plant resistance I'm going to start to the right here. We evaluate in the greenhouse. We'll go ahead and inoculate and determine which one's the resistance to bacterial blight. Just as a, a, I think that's a good service that we, we're able to very easily determine whether they're resistant or not. If you've had bacterial blight problems, find one that's resistant. There's several that, there's a few that are available that are available and that, that at least rotate your susceptible one out to a resistant one. Along with uh, Glenn Studebaker, we run a tarnished plant bug resistance and see some real differences. We do, we do evaluate these varieties in small plots and Glenn puts it up into larger plots uh, to verify what we see in small plots. And for the most part, what we say is resistant turns out pretty resistant in his. Occasionally, one, occasionally he makes a mistake, Bill. No, it's, occasionally it doesn't hold up. But uh, this at least gives us a, an indicator this one here, uh, 28, that's fairly susceptible uh, out of 35. So there's some, here's this one here was uh, number two. So that uh, had the least, almost a uh, very, very low amount of damage. Now, the other thing we, we, we look at trichomes on the leaf, stem, and the bracts. Uh, leaf and stem, we uh, visually rate them. The bract, we actually take samples and count them. Uh, Old evidence indicates that leaf pubescence is related to hope plant resistance. I th there is some relationships there, but I, I've never thought they were real strong. Uh, uh, you know, a very hairy one will give you a little better orange flat bug resistance, and a smooth one will give you a little resistance to worms, but that's, that's kind of, you can find exceptions on that. Uh, but that's one element of host plant re uh, resistance. The more, real important part of these trichomes is that it, as you reduce those trichomes, you reduce the trash, and it's a fiber quality issue. You know, we visually rate the on the stems on these on the trichomes. We'll put them under a viewing scope and actually count. If you look at seed cotton, this is just a, uh, some seed cotton come out of picker. A lot of these little trash things, that's bracts. If you do a real good job of, of defoliating, you shouldn't have leaf tissue. You've got bract tissue. So if we reduce the number of trichomes, look at these trichomes and reduce them on the, the bracts, we should reduce the amount of trash in the, in the fiber. And so that's, that's uh, one of the elements there. So back on this chart here, I'm not so concerned about the leafy vessel rating as what it is in relationship to bract trichomes. You see these here are basically the same uh, or can be very different. Here's one 3.3, 3.2, but it's very different in terms of the number of trichomes on the bracket. So that's where we can look at those a little closer. Uh, and then we look at fiber quality. 
Uh, fiber quality differs, and to me, it is phenomenal what some of our companies have done in recent years on fiber quality. Um, we, we calculate a Q score. This is the thing that we uh, came up with a few years ago. Cut Incorporated helped us with the programming of it. And basically, Q score is a combination of these, these uh, of micro air length, uniformity, and strength. And we can put different weights on each one of those to come up with one score. It makes it very easy. An easy way to think of this, Q score, if it's 70 above, give it an A. If it's in the 60s, think of it as a B. If it's a, in the 50s, it's a C. If it's below 50, you just flunked. I mean, you're not passing. You're, <laughs> you're down to D and Fs. So that, that's kind of just a framework to think about. Here are these three above 70, and they're right at the top of the yield. Uh, another thing to really notice about these fiber traits is look at that, that uh, property, variety by location interaction. It's not significant. When we can, we can enter, that means it's going to be pretty much the same every place. It's not a very, it may di be different in uh, different locations, but the varieties will be about the same rank in every place. So once you get that established, it's there. Except for micron area, it's more environmentally effective. But the others are, are non-significant. So we have done, a, uh, our companies have really done a good job of providing us some super quality varieties that yield well. And that's a big breakthrough. If you look at, uh, oh, oops, you forgot one of my slides, Cater. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it said anyway. <laughs> what it was is some data. It was in there, I know. From, from Australia. I can show you my, where I put it about. <laughs> Shows the negative relationship between fiber quality and yield. And what we have, uh, historically, that's been the case. You know, you think about it, it makes sense. If it were not negative and correlated, as we increase yield, what would we do? We would increase fiber quality. What do you do when you increase yield? Fiber quality tends to go down. These varieties here are starting to break that. that. And it's, it's really a breakthrough for U.S. cotton that we're getting that, 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 that to occur. Because this is how we maintain a big share of the world market is with high quality. Uh, there, some other countries just can't do that. So this last what I've done is taken our, our trace unit variety and also our conventional variety test. And I'm going to put two restrictions on this. First of all, it's got to have an A, and some of these are up in the 80s, so it's A plus. It's got to have very good fiber quality, but then it's got to be in the upper half of, of yield over locations. And you know, here's some, there's a couple of 80, 81, 75, you know, those are some very high quality cottons. Most of this is coming from increased fiber length. So these are some real advances we're making in fiber quality and yield. Now in our conventional, you can't compare, the, these are not necessarily at the same locations. And I cheated a little bit because these are my varieties. So I, when I came down to 67 and 68. That's, uh, you know, that's okay. Uh, most of the time they're in the 60s. How's that? And so if we put them on a, on a if we average it, it'd go up to 70, right? You're grading on a curve. <laughs> <laughs> right. There is. When they notice this UA48, I don't have to cheat on it anymore. It's usually in the 90s. And the reason it's not in the 90s here is because it had a high mic. And the reason it have, has a high mic because it's very early maturing and probably got defoliated, didn't get defoliated on time. So that UA48, and I have, I have bred and crossed and I haven't come up with anything with its fiber quality yet. Uh, it has it is really set a new standard for us for fiber quality. UA222, uh, Ed Youngman uh, markets, and I'm sure he'll be happy to take any orders that you might have. Uh, UA222 is a, a very good, high quality, uh, very widely adapted variety. This one here, I kind of want to introduce you to you, 0701-17. We are, I just submitted a proposal to release it as a substitute of UA103. It's a, it's a very, again, high, high fiber quality, uh, very good yield. It's actually, and this test is out yielding UA222. So, how much cheaper was it to raise those bottom four? 
How much cheaper was it because, was to because, raise? Well, because that's uh, conventional cotton, right? Well, with Nathan Reed, uh, he, what did he say? 60 to $80 less an acre in it. Yeah. And no heel drag. Yeah, that's we what. We did a test with uh, the 222 and the 1518, the 346, and the 5s and 333s. And, uh, and the 222 numerically out yielded everything, but there was a statistical difference between it and the 1518 and 333 and some of the others. So. Now, it takes more management. Yeah. Uh, it's like the sure. Yeah, now the 222, and I'm not yeah. sure about this other, but it, it on the tarnished plant bug, it will save you, it, it's probably, it's more resistant, as, as resistant as most anything out there on plant bugs. Uh, I, I'd have to look. Uh, 48 is not, but 222 is. Uh, that's just some of these subtle differences that, that will occur in here. But your labor for weed control is free, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Nathan and his scout run ragged in the spring, working around Mother Nature trying to get all this stuff out. Well, it, it would be very tough to farm the whole thing, but if he has it in rotation with he has non-GMO beans and GMO and all that. He has it kind of in a rotation, so he's got clean ground to put it on, so it fits in his system. But they run ragged. There is, you know, for him, uh, with the cover crops, it's working. Now, it's got to be a system, and you better, uh, as I think Steve Stevens said, you need a plan going into things. This, you need a plan to go into it. Uh, I, I just have to rely on him, what he's saying. I, I, I haven't done that Pacific type testing, and, and no, my labor is not free. <laughs> you know, it, it comes out of my, it doesn't come out of my pocket, but it comes out of my spending pocket. Okay, one last slide before I run out of time. This Bob Bridge, one a mentor of mine, a great uh, cotton breeder from back in the '80s and '90s. Used to like to say cotton breeders like trying to get a bunch of monkeys up a tree. By the time you think you got them all up, one will uh, jump out. And that's exactly, we, we've got a lot of subtle differences, a lot of things we can take advantage of, but it's kind of, it's a juggling act. And you need to know, just like what George says, you need to know what your situation is and what fits best, because I can guarantee you're not going to get a bride with all the monkeys up there. It just, if it was, us cotton breeders would be out of business, so we don't want that. <laughs> Any other quick questions? I think we've got about a minute or two. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Good job.